All right, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's having a great day today. Uh, thanks for coming. It's bad weather. Attendance, of course, um, never really was required, but it's even less required than it ever was. Uh, so just a quick update on that. I got a couple questions about it. I want to make sure that the attendance policy is clear um, to everyone. So in Banner, I've already marked everyone present for every class meeting. Um, so you know, regardless of whether you attend or don't attend, whether you watch the video, whether you don't watch the video, you're marked present. I'm not doing anything with attendance whatsoever. Uh, it's not for bonus points. It's not for your grade. Uh, it's not for anything. Uh, you know, I was under the impression, and this is my bad, by the way, I was under the impression that I was required to take attendance. Turns out that's not the case. I'm only encouraged to take attendance. So since it's just an encourage and not a requirement, it's uh, going to mark everyone present. So I hope that's okay with everyone. Uh, I can't imagine anyone being upset because, again, it doesn't negatively affect anyone. Um, so, is that clear to everyone? So again, if you go in Banner, you should see you don't have any unexcused absences, regardless of how many times you attend or don't attend. Um, so yeah, that's basically all there is to say there. Uh, you do have the option to attend however you wish to. Uh, you can attend in person every day, uh, at least every day we meet. Uh, that's certainly uh, free to do so. Uh, but beyond that, if you want to continue to follow the hybrid schedule, you can. Um, if you want to attend only virtually, you can do that as well. So nothing like that's really changed. Uh, it's just I'm making it official that anyone who wishes to attend every class period is certainly free to do so. Uh, with, there's plenty of seats in here, uh, you know, so don't worry about that if that's something you'd be worried about. But beyond that, you know, I certainly encourage you to make your decision however you see best fit. It's no big deal to me. Um, so certainly want to make that a uh, give you the freedom to kind of decide how you want to attend. So with that out of the way, we're going to be covering a lot of the basics of chapter four today. So this class is going to be all about the fundamentals of information security. Next class on Tuesday, we'll pick up and do some risk analysis examples, as well as some other more, uh, more practical examples. So today's more theoretical. Next class is going to be more practical. So with that out of the way, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, jump into this. Specifically, we'll be covering information security. We'll be talking about some various threats to information security. We'll be talking about some basic protective measures, as well as some controls. So this is a managerial class. Of course, this is going to focus on uh, how we can approach this from a managerial perspective. So we're not going to cover so much uh, in-depth technological details, uh, just given the nature of what this class is. So one of the first concepts that's important to understand about information security is called the CIA triad. And this really kind of can help organizations shape why they have information security in the first place. There's three major goals. They're up here. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So when we think about this, we first want to make sure that we have availability of the resources. Now, availability refers to uptime. Uh, it's not to be confused with available to only the correct people. Uh, we don't deal with making sure it's available only to the correct people until we get to confidentiality. So availability is simply making sure that the information is accessible to everyone. Confidentiality is making sure that the information is not accessible to people who it should not be accessible to. Uh, so for example, imagine you're a bank. Would you want anyone in the public to be able to see a full list of your customer's social security numbers? Hopefully the answer to that is no. Um, but with availability, you'd want it to be available. Availability is not concerned with who can access it. It's just concerned with it can be accessed. So we think of confidentiality as who it is accessible to. And then lastly, we want to consider integrity. So going back to the example of social security numbers, we want to ensure not only that they're accessible and that they're only accessible to the correct people, not accessible to the incorrect people, we also want to make sure they're correct. Uh, what could be some of the consequences of an incorrect social security number for a bank? I'll list a couple. Uh, so one big consequence could be what if someone earns interest, and we attribute that interest to someone who did not earn the interest? Now, I'm not saying we attribute it to a different account. I'm saying we, for tax purposes, we submit to the IRS that this social security number earned this amount of interest. That could cause problems on someone's taxes. So we want to avoid that sort of situation and want to ensure that we have records that are accurate, they're correct, they're updated, uh, all that sort of stuff. So these are the three major goals. Any policy we implement, we want to ensure that it is going to help our organization 
not only to focus on one of these, but focus on all three. So we wouldn't want to engage in a policy that is going to affect integrity in a positive way, but if it negatively impacts confidentiality, that could be a big concern. So we want to keep that in mind and consider all three in any sort of policy discussion on information security. So with that out of the way, we've kind of established what the goals of information security are. Let's talk about some of the uh, components. You know, how do we best uh, ensure that we're meeting those uh, CIA triad? So first I'm going to talk about exposure. So exposure is simply going to be damage that could result if some sort of threat takes place. So imagine we're a firm, we have our social security database, let's say that for whatever reason, we determine that we have a $100,000 loss potential. That is our exposure. Then when we talk about the threat itself, we're talking about the danger of the exposure. So we're talking about the specific danger itself, that's gonna be the threat. And then lastly, when we talk about vulnerability, all that's saying is the likelihood, so the possibility that the uh, exposure and the threat transpire into an actual incident. Now, uh, I'm not gonna have this, uh, any of these three terms where you're gonna distinguish them on the test because they're quite similar. Um, that'd be pretty tricky of me. I'm not trying to be tricky on the exams, uh, but just kind of keep that in mind. So, you know, you can think about, imagine there is a situation where there are two people. One of the person uh, was mad at the other person. So uh, maybe there's a situation where they did something to the other one, doesn't really matter. So the vulnerability is how likely the person A gets punched in the face by person B. That's the vulnerability. Uh, the exposure would be the punch itself, you know, and then the threat is the damage that would transpire from said punch. So again, you don't have to worry about uh, distinguishing between these two, they're quite related. Uh, and in fact, in practice, a lot of these terms are probably going to be used interchangeably anyway. So I think it'd be kind of silly to worry about how to distinguish between them. Uh, but let's kind of talk about what influences vulnerability. Uh, so in other words, what we're saying is how do we know how likely something is to take place? And this is a list of five things. There's, a, there's really an infinite amount of things that could influence vulnerability. But these are some of the five basic things. So first, most organizations are going to have some sort of a wireless network. And what's the problem with a wireless network? Well, there's not necessarily any inherent problems, but depending upon the configuration of it, if it's left open to the public or it's left open to uh, non-secure devices, then it could certainly lead to a situation where someone can easily uh, sniff the network. They can uh, certainly obtain information they're not supposed to. Uh, lots of different attacks based upon that. And you also have to consider that networks, by definition, they're standards. Uh, we have, of course, the IEEE 802 standards regarding networks. So what does that mean? That means that pretty much any device is theoretically able to access the network, assuming that it follows the standard. Uh, so that means that there's not going to be any uh, security through obscurity because any device pretty much can access it very easily. I uh, think going beyond that, we also have a consideration of, well, someone could hypothetically get the data, but can they do anything with it? Well, you know, imagine we had a customer database. Let's say the customer database has every piece of customer information we have. Say we have 100,000 customers. Let's say the entirety of our customer database is one gigabyte. So this is not necessarily the largest vulnerability factor ever, but is it expensive to purchase one gigabyte worth of storage? It's not, it's quite inexpensive. Uh, so that's certainly going to be something that factors in. Now imagine if that same uh, customer database instead took up 100 terabytes. 100 terabytes is gonna cost a couple thousand dollars to store. So certainly that's gonna be uh, cost prohibitive to some uh, organizations, but not all. So I wouldn't focus necessarily exclusively on the cost of data storage when determining vulnerability. It's in the textbook, that's kind of the logic behind it though. Uh, increase ease of hacking. Certainly lots of tools are publicly available. You can watch tutorials, you can read tutorials. Uh, it's quite simple for a lot of the uh, lower level uh, sort of hacking incidents that you could do. Uh, it's not very difficult. So the fact that it's not difficult means there's gonna be enhanced likelihood of them occurring. Uh, if they were more difficult, you would anticipate fewer people having the skills, fewer people having the interest, whatever the case may be, you would anticipate having a lower risk there. Uh, organized crime nation states, uh, this is something that could be a little bit controversial to discuss, but I think it goes without saying that there are certainly some nations that dislike other nations. 
Uh, and as such, there could be the possibility of certain nations attacking other nations' uh, infrastructure. Uh, we see this with things like the Stuxnet worm, where I believe Israel is accused of attacking uh, some of the infrastructure in the Middle East. Again, it's accusations. I'm not saying it happened or did not happen, but that's an example of an organized uh, nation state attack, allegedly. Uh, of course, then, you know, another vulnerability factor is lack of management support. So, as we talked about in this course, uh, management support is really crucial for the success of any sort of project, any sort of policy, really anything within an organization. Because if management doesn't support something, it means you're not getting resources. It means you're not getting time allocated to the fulfillment of whatever you set out to do. So in security, imagine if management refused to purchase anything that would aid the security of an organization. You would anticipate that would increase the vulnerability of the firm uh, accordingly. So. Those are just five basic vulnerability factors. These are not the only ones. Uh, there are certainly many others, and these are just five of the common ones. So let's go through a little bit more and talk about some specific types of threats. So there's really going to be three major types of threats that we're going to discuss. So the first is going to be external. So and an external threat, as the name implies, it's going to be perpetrated by people outside the organization. So this could be people in another country. It could be people in the same country. Um, but bottom line is they're not associated with the organization. Uh, contrast a little bit with internal threats. Uh, internal threats, as the name would apply, internal to the organization. It could be a disgruntled employee. Uh, it could even be an employee who's not disgruntled, but accidentally does something. That's still a threat. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's intentional or unintentional, although that is, of course, a distinction within internal threats is, was it intentional, was it unintentional? Uh, and then lastly, we have hybrid threats. So hybrid threats, are going to be typically where you have some sort of insider within the organization, but the bulk of the work is going to be done by typically outside parties. So these are the three major ones. Uh, of course, then we also have internet threats. So internet threats comprise many categories. Uh, typically, we're going to see these transpire as things like malware. Uh, we're going to talk more about specific types of malware in a couple slides. Uh, denial of service, which of course we think about denial of service. What is that going to affect on the CIA triad if we're not able to access a resource? It's going to affect the uh, availability. So if the information is not available, that's going to be a problem. We think about malware. Uh, malware could really do any of the three. Uh, most likely, it would affect confidentiality. Uh, but in practice, you know, we can certainly see malware that um, you know, uses excessive system resources and prevents the uh, legitimate access or availability of resources. Uh, we could, of course, also see malware that affects the integrity of files. Uh, there's really no limit to what malware could do in terms of that. Uh, then lastly, of course, unauthorized access. So that's just simply someone accessing the system that they don't have uh, authority or authorization, rather, to access. So pretty straightforward there. Uh, but we're not limited to just things that are uh, man-made. So we can certainly look beyond that and see that there's a lot of things that we don't necessarily directly control. Uh, natural disasters are particularly uh, problematic from a perspective of availability and that they can disrupt the availability. They can keep employees from entering an office physically. Uh, they can keep a system from getting power. They can keep a system from getting network connectivity. Uh, things like floods. You know, uh, hopefully we don't see any flooding today, but there's a lot of rain. Uh, that could certainly uh, keep people from attending something physical uh, because it could be dangerous. Would you risk your life for a system? Uh, hopefully the answer is no, but you certainly could if you wanted to. Uh, many people choose to not. Uh, so any sort of storm, earthquake, uh, earthquakes are pretty notorious for things like fires. Uh, fires could be another serious problem. Uh, so of course we'd want to have systems in place to mitigate fires. Of course, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But if we have a data center, do we just want to put a standard uh, water-based fire sprinkler system in? No, we wouldn't, because that would uh, certainly cause some issues with the availability of the system. If it ever goes off, all the information is likely going to be lost. So instead, we want to use some sort of a gas base, like Halon or some other similar gas, to where we can then ensure that the information is not going to be compromised if the event of the... Uh, you know, if some fire or something causes it to go off, or it could just accidentally go off. Certainly not uncommon for a sprinkler head to get uh, affected in some adverse way, and then to have a release. Uh, 
Some other man-made disasters, we just talked about fires. You want to make sure you prevent them. Uh, it's like Smokey the Bear says, only you can prevent fires. I, I don't know where that leaves me. I guess I can't do anything about preventing fire. I always found that kind of uh, a funny little statement there, but it's not that funny. Uh, power outages. You know, Again, you can have some sort of a generator, but you know, if you have a generator, it's important to ensure that it's properly maintained, has proper amounts of fuel, um, all that sort of stuff associated with it. Otherwise, is a generator without fuel going to be very useful to you? I can't imagine it would. Uh, cut cables. Uh, it's not uncommon. I think a couple years back at Mississippi State, there was a case where a, I think it was a backhoe or something was digging and cut a fiber optic line. You know, internet was out for a couple of days. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that could certainly happen. So any sort of outage like that can certainly affect the availability of a system and potentially even the integrity of a system as well. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit more about internal threats. So these previous were mostly going to be external, although you could argue that a fire is probably more internal, uh, given the fact that it's probably started by something inside the organization. Uh, but not all the time. So, uh, you know, things like what do employees do? Well, they can do lots of things. Uh, theft of assets. So if we had a physical computer and it had information on it that we need as an organization, what if someone just walks away with it? We no longer have that information, assuming that's the only copy that we had. So some potential mitigating steps would be things like physical access controls, um, having backups, you know, certainly those sorts of things. It can be very advantageous for a firm to employ. Uh, illegal copying, or at least not necessarily illegal, but unauthorized copying of records. Uh, this is a very interesting ethical discussion. Uh, it's very common in the sales industry, at least stereotypically common in sales, for a, an employee upon departure to copy their sales uh, contacts. Now, is that ethical or unethical? It really depends upon your definition of ethics, but it's generally viewed in the business community as unethical to do so because it's generally presumed that the contacts you make as a sales associate for one company belong to the company as opposed to the individual. Now, I'm not here to say whether something's right or wrong. It's really for you to kind of determine for yourself. Uh, unauthorized access kind of similar to unauthorized copying, only this is going to be a little bit different. So uh, a couple of years back, there was actually a case where I believe uh, at least a dozen, possibly more, uh, nurses at a Chicago hospital were fired for unauthorized access of a particular uh, patient's medical records. So it's certainly something that can happen. They were not directly assigned to that patient, yet they accessed a certain uh, patient's medical records, and they got themselves fired. So it could certainly be a bad thing to do. Uh, it certainly violated privacy of the patient. And it also violated the company policies. So the company policies state you're only supposed to access uh, medical records of people you're uh, associated with the care of. Um, you know, kind of beyond that, though, it doesn't have to be something uh, intentional. There's certainly a lot of unintentional acts that an employee can do that would compromise the security of an organization. So imagine uh, some example of uh, bypassing security. So let's say that an organization has a policy that says every five minutes, if there's no activity on a workstation, it gets logged out. So how could someone get around that? Well, they could wiggle the mouse every four minutes for someone, and they could stay logged in. Now, a problem with doing that is the workstation could be unintended for those four minutes. It certainly violates the intent of the policy, yet it doesn't violate the practice of the policy. So in that regard, it could be considered a threat. Uh, then lastly, data entry errors. Let's say someone enters information incorrectly. What could that do? Well, it could lead to a loss in revenue. Uh, imagine you enter someone's address incorrectly. You never send them an invoice. That's money lost. Um, you know, imagine that you enter uh, banking information incorrectly. That's money lost. Now, of course, it could go beyond that as well. But those are just some common examples of why data entry errors are a problem for organizations. Now, how can they get around data entry errors? Well, in practice, there's not really going to be a perfect way to do so. Uh, common approaches would be things like validating to make sure that the input is, in fact, a legal address. Um, so that could at least um, mitigate it to some degree. Of course, I think the uh, post office has an API that firms can use just to kind of make sure that the address is recognized by USPS and provide suggestions if it's not. But, you know, by and large, we could also do things like just validating the input to make sure that a phone number is, in fact, a 10-digit number. Or if we're talking about other countries, it has a country code. So. Lots of different examples there. Any questions so far?
people. As always, feel free to jump in with any questions. I'm happy to address them. Uh, but some more potential threats associated with employees. Uh, so things like using a weak password. So if one employee inside of an organization, let's just say that any employee within an organization can access the same data. You have 100 employees. 99 of them are using a strong password. One of them is using password123 exclamation mark. It only takes one account to get compromised to access an organization from the inside. So having strong password policies can be a good thing, but people can still get around them by doing uh, something like what I just suggested with that password. So, you know, certainly that could be a problem. Uh, lack of knowledge of training. It's very common for organizations to employ things like SATA technology, or not SATA technology, just SATA. Security, education, and training awareness. Uh, it's very common to have to go through, do the training. Um, Maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not, but certainly that's something that could transpire. And at least to some degree, mitigate that. Uh, social engineering attacks, these are quite common. Uh, particularly, they're more targeted. So it could be a situation where an employee has access to information, someone impersonates them, they have some sort of uh, fake emergency. Whatever the case may be, it's not uncommon to see this transpire. Uh, then any sort of other human error. You know, humans are not perfect. Uh, I'll use myself as an example. I thought I had to take attendance. Turns out I don't. Uh, that's human error. Um, you know, I apologize for any issues that may have caused, but you know, mostly I don't think it caused any major issues there. So, um, you know, that's certainly something that could take place, though. I've got a quick little video here. Uh, I'm going to mute it. It does have a, a little bit of language in there, um, but it's still a funny example of an internal threat that I'm going to play. So, let me just mute it. All right, I think I'm unmuted now, and I'm back. So uh, that's a funny scene. If you get a chance to watch Office Space and you haven't, I'd certainly recommend it. But what's happening inside that scene is they're basically creating a program that will, in, pra in theory, is supposed to take just a little bit of the uh, uh, remaining decimal. So if they had, let's say, a transaction that was for $10.32, but then there was something beyond that, they would just take whatever's beyond that and put it into account. In practice, they had a rounding error that actually ended up with them receiving quite a bit more than they anticipated. So that's theft. Uh, certainly doing something like that is something that will cost the organization lots of money. Certainly going to be an internal employee threat. Each of those three employees up there were internal to the organization. They wrote the application, and then they uh, installed it. So again, I do apologize for not having any audio with that video. I uh, just didn't want to have any sort of uh, foul language that was being uh, spoken or sung, rather, so just keep that in mind. Um, but that's kind of what was going on inside the video.
I think you can make an argument that it's a little bit funnier without the audio anyway. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But then beyond that, we've talked about employees. Let's talk more about the system itself. So uh, if we have any sort of software on that could be authorized or unauthorized, the software itself could cause us problems. So if we have a system that has software installed, maybe it's our ERP application, for example. Let's say that it has a bug that incorrectly uh, handles decimals. So maybe it rounds up when it should round down. Maybe it um, doesn't handle the comma the same. Whatever the case may be, let's just say that it has some inaccurate information in it. That's going to lead to problems with data integrity. If our data doesn't have integrity, it's pretty much useless to us. So generally speaking, we want to avoid that sort of issue. Uh, of course, we could also have any sort of malware, which we're going to talk about in a couple slides here. But the idea is that the malware, of course, could lead to things like information being released that we didn't intend to. Uh, that could certainly cause an organization problems. So, uh, of course, beyond the software itself, we could have hardware problems. So, imagine there was physical theft. We've talked about that. You're losing your data that way. You know, not only do you no longer have the data, it could also cause your organization problems if the data is released without authorization. It could be legal consequences. It could be loss of a competitive advantage. Uh, certainly, those are going to be the two primary problems there. Uh, then, of course, we also have the issue of physical spying. You know, beyond something being physically stolen, what if someone uh, spies in a physical fashion? So examples of this could be like a key logging device where every keystroke, every mouse movement, anything like that, it's going to be recorded and sent off somewhere. Or it's going to be recorded and picked up at some point. Um, certainly anything like that. Unauthorized cameras. You could certainly imagine how those could be problematic. You know, imagine they're collecting pin information. Or even worse yet, imagine they're inside of a location where a camera would be uh, for the lack of a better term, it'd be inappropriate. That would certainly be uh, a potential to open up an organization to liabilities. That could certainly lead to lots of damage, uh, something to that effect. So generally speaking, it's not just about the software, it's also about the hardware. Then, of course, we want to shift gears a little bit. You know, a lot of these so far have been maybe indeliberate or accidental. There's also deliberate threats. You know, certainly we've talked about a few. Uh, espionage and trespass, very common within the corporate industry to have corporate espionage, you know, spying on another organization, maybe trying to get trade secrets, maybe trying to get intellectual property, uh, anything like that can certainly be a problem for an organization to deal with. Now, of course, how does an organization handle that sort of thing? Well, it depends on the organization, but in general, you don't want to ensure that any sort of uh, information that's very secure is kept secure. You want to have it accessible to as few people as possible. So that's going to ensure that it has confidentiality, or at least the best amount of confidentiality that it can achieve. Uh, information extortion. This is pretty common nowadays with things like ransomware applications, where there will be some information stored, and someone will encrypt it in such a way that the company is no longer able to access their own information, demand a ransom for the decryption of it. Sabotage or vandalism. Uh, that could certainly be something quite common with a disgruntled employee. Maybe they could dislike their organization so much to take a, uh, you know, some sort of baseball bat or something like that, and they damage a physical piece of hardware. Uh, there's also another office scene, I don't have it in here, uh, from office space, if you remember the printer scene. You know, they take the printer to a field, and they start beating it with the baseball bat. Uh, quite a humorous scene if you get a chance to watch it. Uh, theft of equipment, we've talked about that. Identity theft. Uh, that could certainly also be a problem as well. Imagine your organization is entrusted with data, and they don't do the bare basics to protect it. Uh, what's that going to cost your organization? It's going to open it up to liability. It's going to cause potential uh, regulatory problems. You could certainly run into problems where if you're not complying with existing regulations, you could get fines. You could have the establishment of new regulations that you have to comply with. That's going to be costly as well. So certainly anything like that you want to avoid to the degree possible, such that you're not opening yourself up to unnecessary financial harm. Uh, compromise this intellectual property, we've covered that as well. Basically, you just want to make sure that you're having the intellectual property available to as few people as possible to prevent the likelihood that any of those people who it's available to will use it against you. Software attacks, we're going to talk about that. Alien software, we're going to cover that as well in a couple slides. Uh, supervisory control and data acquisition attacks. Uh, this is going to be important for things that are going to be some sort of industrial control system. A common example of this would be like a water treatment plant. Uh, but it goes beyond that. You know, any sort of uh, public utility is going to be an example. Uh, but beyond that, also anything like uh, a manufacturing plant. So 
they have this very critical infrastructure, and if that's attacked, people could uh, have physical harm. You know, it's certainly something we wouldn't want to see happen. So, you know, it's very important to have these sort of uh, preventative measures in place to prevent any sort of uh, disruption of service or even worse. So, uh, then of course, cyber terrorism and cyber warfare, we kind of talked about that already as well. Okay, I wasn't sure exactly where this malware slide was, but I knew it was in here somewhere. Uh, so, certainly there's lots of different types of malware. So, malware is just going to be any sort of malicious application that's written with the intent of causing harm in some way, shape, or form. This harm could be anything from disrupting service to, um, you know, basically stealing all the data. So, uh, most basic application that we're going to talk about is going to be a virus. So, a computer virus is going to be something that's going to be installed by some user action. And it could do really anything that it's programmed to. Typically speaking, it's going to disrupt uh, service in some way. Uh, but it could also do things like um, send information to a third party, something like that. Now, this contrasts a little bit with Worm. So a worm is going to be an application that's going to be installed for some vulnerability, and it's going to be self-replicating. So typically speaking, uh, this is going to happen in a large network environment where it's going to be utilizing some uh, vulnerability that has yet to be patched on the network for whatever reason. Uh, so that's certainly something to uh, be concerned with if that's your job to be concerned with it. Uh, Trojan Horse is simply going to be an application that masquerades itself as a legitimate application. So Possibly you could download an application, install it, everything could look good, uh, but maybe it has some additional component that is malicious in nature. So that's going to be quite common if you're downloading software from untrusted sources, for example. Uh, backdoor. So a backdoor attack would be something where the device or software that you have has some sort of a, uh, by design, has access that is not known to the person who purchased it. So this is common in a lot of uh, physical devices where there's a sort of a master account associated with things. And it's done by the manufacturer. So, you know, what happens is the manufacturer is able to access the account and you don't even necessarily know the account is there. Uh, this was uh, a couple years back, there was some cameras that were found out to have a uh, back door associated with them such that the manufacturer, located in China, was able to access the live feed from the cameras. And uh, since the United States federal government has banned uh, those certain brands that were associated with that from use in any federal property. So certainly that can be a big problem. You know, imagine if uh, certainly someone who was hostile towards you was able to view all the cameras inside an organization. And not only that, you have to remember, you know, cameras have a physical feed, but many security cameras have an audio feed as well. So that could certainly be even worse than just having a video feed. You know, so that's certainly something to consider there. Uh, logic bomb. So logic bombs are basically just going to be applications or some sort of, uh, not even necessarily a full application, some sort of code that at some point has some sort of trigger that will be met. So typically this is going to be some sort of a time frame. So maybe it's going to be four weeks after installing, it will do what it's set out to do. Uh, it'll basically deploy the payload. But it could also be something where after so many hours of being on, whatever the case may be, there's some condition that's going to be eventually fulfilled, and then it will do what it's set out to do. So ransomware, uh, we've talked about that today a little bit. Basically, it's just an application that forcefully encrypts uh, a specified range of files. Could be the entire hard drive, could be the documents folder. It really depends on the ransomware application itself. But what it does is it then demands a payment for in exchange for the decryption key. And if you don't have a backup, you may not be able to decrypt any of the files on the system. Of course, depending on the ransomware application, some of them use better encryption than others, and you may be able to decrypt the files without having any sort of a physical key. Or not a physical, there's no physical key. I'm saying without having the uh, decryption key. Uh, and then lastly, spyware. As the name would imply, this is going to be applications that are designed to basically send information uh, about a user's habits, about what they do, anything like that to a third party. Uh, any questions about these? All right. So, you know, there are other types of software attacks as well, though. Uh, certainly, they're not going to be uh, an application that's installed or run, but things like a basic phishing attack. So, a phishing attack, of course, is going to be any sort of uh, communication. Typically, this is thought of as an email, but it could be other communications as well, where the intent is to impersonate uh, a legitimate authority 
and to then obtain maybe user credentials, maybe payment information, whatever the case may be, you're obtaining some information by deception. Uh, spear phishing is a little bit different. Uh, it's still similar to phishing, only the difference between spear phishing and phishing is that in spear phishing, it's a targeted approach. So maybe you have access to a company's records and you can see who their actual customers are. And you could even put in legitimate information about their account number. Uh, basically, all you're doing is you're making a more targeted phishing attack. Uh, and then an even more targeted uh, example of a phishing attack is whaling. So in whaling, what you're doing, you're not only targeting people, you're targeting high-level people. Typically, this could be things like C-level executives. It could be things like top government officials. Uh, whatever the case may be, that would be an example of a whaling attack where basically you're wanting to get the top-level credentials for an organization. Uh, eavesdropping is going to be a physical way of uh, obtaining information, but basically all you're doing is you're listening to a conversation you're not a member of. Now, of course, there's different types of eavesdropping. There's physical eavesdropping. Uh, there's also going to be electronic eavesdropping. So, you know, of course, in many states, there's going to be a one-party consent law for audio recording, meaning that if you're a party of a conversation, you can record it without informing the other person. Uh, some states require uh, two-party or all-party consent, but that's only a handful of states. Uh, again, this is not legal advice or anything, but certainly uh, if you're not a part of the conversation at all, it's going to be eavesdropping. It could be uh, punished by uh, you know, some certainly legal consequences there. So you'd want to avoid that. Uh, and then lastly, of course, shoulder surfing. So shoulder surfing is simply looking at information that you're not uh, you know, supposed to be looking at, basically. So imagine there was someone in this classroom, not saying there is, but someone was scrolling through a Facebook feed. And someone behind them thinks, that's an interesting Facebook feed. I'm going to look at it. That's shoulder surfing. Uh, really straightforward. So basically, for uh, eavesdropping, of course, how can you mitigate that? Well, you cannot say information in public that you wouldn't want people to hear. Uh, so, you know, for example, if you had something confidential, you wouldn't want to take the phone call in the middle of class, because I can guarantee you, Pretty much everyone's going to be eavesdropping, including me. Uh, so that'd be a bad thing to do. Uh, shoulder surfing. You know, make sure that you're not uh, viewing information you wouldn't want other people to see inside of public. Uh, you know, of course, if you wanted to, you could get a privacy screen, uh, but that's typically not going to happen because it's not going to make your image look as nice, even if you're sitting directly in front of it. It's also going to be costly. It's not going to be very effective anyway. So those are basically the uh, sort of kind of uh, edging the gap between a physical attack and a software attack. These are kind of hybrid in that way. Uh, let's talk about how we can mitigate some of these physical attacks, though. So we talked about locks. Having locks is not enough. Making sure they're in use properly is going to be a lot more beneficial. You know, I always find it uh, not funny, because I don't uh, laugh at people being victims of crime, but, you know, certainly it's, it's a problem when people get robbed, and they say, well, how'd they enter the house? Well, the front door was unlocked. Well, that's not going to do you much good. It doesn't matter what type of lock you have if it's not going to be used. So certainly making sure that you use, not only having locks, but using them in the appropriate fashion. Uh, and then, of course, beyond that, if you want to protect a property, not just a building, uh, you could use things like uh, some sort of a gate, some sort of a uh, fence, you know, something to that degree, to prevent unauthorized entry to a property. So it's going to be very common for things like uh, high-end research labs, um, really anything where that level of physical security would be needed. Uh, of course, human security guards. Now, they're not going to be perfect, but they can certainly act as a deterrent to unauthorized physical access of a space. Um, then, of course, using things like ID cards. Uh, probably going to be very beneficial to use things for that uh, lock that use automatic ID cards because let's say an employee leaves and you have an organization of 100,000 people. Uh, let's say you fire one person. You know, are you going to want to issue a new key every time you fire one person? I can't imagine you would. Uh, an organization of 100,000 people, someone's getting canned every day. So certainly if you have an ID card and that's how people enter or leave a facility, that's going to be a lot easier to replace because all you have to do is disable the access to that one specific ID card. It's going to be a much easier way to um, you know, certainly run a business. Uh, so access controls. Uh, so when you think about how do we actually go through the process of accessing a system? So there's going to be three steps. So first we have identification, saying who is wanting the access. So that's going to be things like a username. It could be things like a name if it's a physical uh, thing. 
you know, whatever the case is, you're saying who is actually doing that. That's the identity. Then you have authentication. So you're saying, not only do I want to actually uh, be this person, how do I prove I'm this person? So we use things like a password. Uh, we can use things like biometric devices, you know, fingerprint, eye scan, um, you know, palm print. Certainly any of those things could be a way to verify an identity. Uh, and then beyond that, we want to authorize. So not only have we made sure that the person is who they say they are, we then want to take a step further and actually give them the access. So that last step, if we don't do that last step, we don't have any availability. So thinking back to CIA Trad, we want to make sure that we have not only confidentiality and integrity, but also availability. So in the authorization step, we of course grant them the access that they have access to. Uh, talking a little bit more about communication controls here. Uh, at a basic level, you know, we talked about there could be threats with a wireless network or any network. So how can we mitigate that? Well, here's a non-exclusive non list, but there's certainly some very commonly employed uh, devices or software to ensure the uh, confidentiality remains intact for an organization's network. So the first thing can be a basic firewall. So pretty much every corporation is likely going to be using some sort of a firewall. It could be software-based, it could be hardware-based. But the concept is, is that we're having control over what information flows through a network and what information does not. Now, this is also going to have other uses for things like employee monitoring. So the firewalls applications are typically going to do things like monitor which employees are accessing which external resources. Uh, that could be good or bad, I'm not here to say. But from an employee standpoint, it's something to be mindful of. From a corporation standpoint, it's something to know and to ensure it's being used, if that's what your organization wishes. Uh, then, of course, the demilitarized zone to be a little bit different. So what that's saying is we have some public part of our network. Typically, we're going to host things that are going to be external. So if we had a corporate website, we would put that inside of a demilitarized zone such that we have free access to it. You know, anyone, basically, in the public can access the demilitarized zone, but we don't let them breach that demilitarized zone. So they can't access anything that's internal to our organization. So that's really all it's saying there. You know, of course, the famous demilitarized zone. Think about the, uh, you know, certainly we have the two Koreas, North South Korea. And between the two, there's a demilitarized zone. It's the same concept, uh, meaning that, you know, well, I guess in that case, you can't really freely travel between the two. But in this case, uh, you can't freely travel between the demilitarized zone and the, uh, you know, the standard internal network. So think about it in that way. Uh, and then, of course, we have anti-malware systems. So, uh, you know, typically, these could be referred to as an antivirus system. But when we're talking about at the corporate level, it's not good enough to have an application that runs on every system. We want to have an application that runs on every system that not only uh, removes malware and prevents it from being run in the first place, but that also notifies a central authority. It could be your information security team, it could be your IT team, whatever the case may be. We want to then ensure that we look at the physical hardware, we inspect the software on it, and ensure that there was no uh, sort of actual breach of information. So that central reporting is a very uh, important example, not necessarily an example, it's a very important component of any sort of anti-malware system for an organization to use, uh, certainly a large organization. Uh, encryption. So we've talked about some potential downsides of encryption, but it's also a good thing. Uh, certainly, if we're encrypting sensitive information such that only we, the organization, are able to access it, that's going to have lots of good things. Imagine someone steals uh, a computer or some device that has sensitive information on it. If we employ encryption, assuming it's good encryption, uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, then do anything with it. They wouldn't be able to read it in any way. So that's certainly going to be a very beneficial thing for us to do. Uh, virtual private networking, uh, of course, some of you are probably familiar with it, maybe. Uh, basically, the whole concept is, is that we have some sort of a way for companies, or for not at companies, for employees of an organization to access resources from anywhere. So they can access it as though they were on a physical location using a physical network, only they don't have to be. So this could be used for things like file storage, file transfer, um, anything like that. Uh, more commonly, it's used for remote access. You know, people can remote access a machine that they have access to uh, from anywhere in the world using a virtual private network. Uh, then, of course, employee monitoring. We've talked about that a good bit as well. Uh, any questions so far? Again, always feel free to jump in with any questions at any time. Um, but then, of course, we also want to talk a little bit about business continuity planning. So 
we talked early on about some of these threats. You know, we have a fire. Can we prevent a forest fire? Well, you know, of course, Smokey the Bear would say yes. But as a company, can we truly prevent a forest fire? For the, let's say lightning strikes. Yeah. Can we do anything to stop that? I mean, you might make an argument that we could. But for the most part, you know, natural disasters are things that we don't necessarily control. Now, fire is probably not the best example. Uh, let's say, can we prevent an earthquake? I don't know of any ways at all to prevent an earthquake, really. Uh, of course, we could make our buildings and design in such a way that we're not going to have any sort of uh, building collapse from an earthquake. But by and large, you know, we can't really do much to prevent the earthquake itself. So even if our building is still standing, if the roads around it are inaccessible, then it doesn't really matter because employees aren't going to be able to access the location anyway. So the bottom line is we want to have some sort of a formally uh, document that is going to allow us to say, this is how we're going to operate in the event that we can't physically access a location. This is how we're going to operate if a system is down. You know, all those sorts of things. We've gone ahead and planned out various scenarios, and that way, whenever something does happen, as it will invariably at some point, we have something predefined. We have a like more, uh, at least a larger chance of not having any sort of disruption in service, or at least minimizing the disruption in service. So basically, all this document is saying is, if something happens, this is how we're going to respond. And everyone has access to it. So presumably, everyone would be able to refer to it should some sort of disaster take place. Uh, of course, within this, there's a discussion of you know, various types of sites. So you'll see up here, I have hot sites, warm sites, and cold sites. So all this is really saying is, in a hot site, we have not only all the hardware and software and everything already installed, we basically could have a spare office, fully equipped, everything's up to date, all the software we need, everything that we need is already established. It's like an empty office that's completely fur uh, furnished. Now, that contrasts with a cold site. So inside of a cold site, we have an empty office building. No furniture, no technology, no software. It's just an empty office building. We could certainly use it, but it would certainly take some time to get everything used. And then instead of a warm site, it's sort of a, uh, a hybrid between the two. So maybe we have some of the technology, but not all the software loaded and up to date. Maybe we have furniture, but not every single piece of furniture. Yeah, it's, it's in between the hot and the cold site. Does that make sense? So hot site has everything ready to go. Cold site has nothing ready to go, but at least has a building. And warm site has some combination of those two. OK, so another important discussion is auditing. So instead of an information system audit, we have lots of information being processed. We have information that's being input. We have information that's being output. And we have information that's being processed somewhere in there. So instead of an audit, what we're doing is we're making sure that all that process has integrity. Uh, we don't want to have a situation where we have information flowing that is going to be uh, adversely affected, could be made incorrect at some point in the process. What we're doing is we're looking for that. And of course, we can do this internally or externally. Uh, externally, a lot of accounting firms particularly the big three, are now providing IS auditing services. So if you're an accountant, you may end up doing some of this. If you're an IS manager, you may end up working for an accounting agency doing some of this. Uh, it could certainly be something that you could do externally, but also within the organization as well. Now, it's very important to ensure uh, that your organization uses something like a testing environment. So if they're rolling out a new change, they can easily see what that change will impact. And it's very common to have a production environment, maybe even several testing environments. Uh, it's very common inside of modern organizations to do that, both internally and externally. Uh, so risk, uh, we're going to pick up with the risk next class. Um, yeah, we'll just do that next class. Just kind of wrap up the day, though. Uh, we covered information security. We covered uh, various threats associated with it. We also covered various protections and various controls. Any questions about anything today? All right, well, thanks for coming. I hope you all have a great day.